Blog Talk Radio. Welcome back to Fundamentally Mormon. I'm your host, Mark Lichtenwalter. Today we're going to be continuing on with reading the book, Michael Adam, speaking about the Adam-God Doctrine. We'll be on pages 68 to 71. We're in chapter 7, which is titled, Michael the Creator. The program today is pretty short on the reader program. It's only about eight minutes long. We'll get right into that. And then the guest call-in line is 917-889-8827. And we will be reading the text with commentary. And we invite people to call into the radio show with any questions or comments. But let's get to the reader portion of the program. Here we go. Michael N. Dash, the Creator, Chapter 7 of Michael Adam on the Adam God Doctrine, pages 68 to 71. If Adam, Michael, was an exalted being, it follows then that he was the creator of this earth and Ash instructed by his God and assisted by his brethren. Brigham Young declared, We say that Father Adam came here and helped to make an earth. Who is he? He is Michael, the great prince, and it was said to him by Loim, Go here and make an earth. What is the great mystery about it? He came and formed the earth. Adam came here and got it up in shape that would suit him to commence business. What is the great mystery about it? None that I have seen. The mystery in this, as with miracles, or anything else, is only to those who are ignorant. There's News 22, 308, Bishop Babenum gives logical reason for this principle by saying, It seems strange that people will believe that, as man now is, God once was, and that is God now is, man may be, that, God is an exalted man and still repudiate the doctrine of Adam God. These incredulous people believe that Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael, Adam, the father of all living, created the world and yet cannot believe that he is the God of this world. It seems presumptuous indeed for them to ever aspire to be the God of anything, if Adam cannot be the God of the world he created and peopled. If a man is not to become the god of his own posterity, what will he be the god of? Supplement to Gospel Problems, Penyon, page 9, 69. President Young explains the significance of the name of Adam and how he obtained his role in the creation. Why was Adam called Adam? He was the first man on the earth, and its primer and maker. He, with the help of his brethren, brought it into existence. Then he said, I want my children who are in the spirit world to come and live here. I once dwelt upon an earth something like this, in a mortal state. I was faithful, I received my crown and exaltation. I have the privilege of extending my work, and to its increase there will be no end. There's News Weekly 22 308. Brigham Young even states that Adam was the chief manager in the creation of this earth. Though we have it in history that our father Adam was made of the dust of this earth, and that he knew nothing about his God previous to being made here, yet it is not so. And when we learn the truth, we shall see and understand that he helped to make this world, and was the chief manager in that operation. J. 
Journal of Discourses 3, 319, Apostle Franklin D. Richards, President of the European Mission, explained the following scripture, And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. General 128 If the Lord God has ever withdrawn from Father Adam the authority he bestowed upon him, he has not seen fit to make it known to the world. Adam has continued to bear rule over the earth, and, 70, controlled the destinies of his never-ending posterity. From the time he received his commission in the Garden of Eden, he has been laboring diligently to fulfill the instructions they given him by the Lord God concerning his dominions, and to bring them under subjection to his will. This will be fully accomplished when every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that he is the God of the whole earth. Then will the words of the prophet Brigham, when speaking of Adam, be fully realized and dash he is our Father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Mill. Star 17, 195. Brigham Young, in the following four references, declared that one of the first missions of resurrected, exalted beings is to begin the work of creating and peopling an earth, and eventually acting as judge thereon. When they receive their crowns, their dominions, that then will be prepared to frame earths like unto ours and to people them in the same manner as we have been brought forth by our parents, by our Father and our God. Journal of Discourses 18, 259, Adam was an immortal being when he came to this earth. He had lived on an earth similar to ours. He had received the priesthood and the keys thereof and had been faithful in all things, and had gained resurrection, and his exaltation, and was crowned with glory, immortality and eternal lives, and was numbered with the gods, for such he was through his faithfulness. And he has begotten all of the spirits that were to come to this earth. Old John Nuttall Journal, 118, if you look at things spiritually, and then naturally, and see how they appear together, you will understand that when you have the privilege of commencing the work that Adam commenced on this earth, you will have all your children come and report to you of their sayings and acts. And you will hold, 71, every son and daughter of yours responsible when you get the privilege of being an Adam on earth. Journal of Discourses 4, 271. They, the twelve tribes, will come up tribe by tribe, and the ancient of Ace, he who led Abraham, and talked to Noah, Enoch, Isaac, and Jacob, the very being will come and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Journal of Discourses 11, 326. Hence, all men who gain the crown of exaltation will bear spirit children and create an earth like this for them. They will then become an Adam upon the earthly creation and, together with their Eve, produce mortal tabernacles so that those children may follow their laws of progression as their father has done before them. The glory of God is manifest in bringing to pass the eternal life of his children so that his creations may continue to roll on through the eternities, gaining an increase of dominions, power, and glory forever. The plan of salvation consists of a never-ending creation of earths and an ever-growing family of children. 72, Chapter 8, Jesus N. Dash, the son of Adam. The guest call in number is 917 889 
917-889-8827. That's 917-889-8827. There is a chat room available during the live program at blogtalkradio.com forward slash fundamentally Mormon. And I have posted the links in the description for the reading of this chapter where you can read it yourself for free online. The link to read this book for free online and other great books of restoration theology for free online. You can also follow me at facebook.com forward slash L-A-Z-U-R-U-S 1977. If you do call in with a question or comment, please be patient. When we finish the reading, I will bring you on if you want to be on. If I see that you have called in, I will take you into the uh, studio and you'll be off air and you can ask me whatever questions or comments and I will ask you if you want to go live. If you want to go live, um, just uh, be patient and we'll bring you live after the reading. So we had a pretty good discussion with an individual last night and I really enjoyed it. A Christian who called in and uh, I welcome, I've had Christians and Hindus and Muslims and uh, individuals who, uh, well, I don't think I've had any Jews on. I mean, I am Jewish. Uh, my grandmother was a Reisovitz from Czechoslovakia in East Germany, and they were East German Jews. But um, we welcome everybody to call in, even atheists, as long as they don't um, cuss on my program or start calling names. So anyway, um, my son Emmett is going to be reading tonight, and I will be commenting as he completes each page. So we'll uh, go to that point. Thank you for listening, everyone. And uh, one last time, the guest call-in number is 917 917- Eight eight nine eight eight two seven. Hello. Um. Yeah, I'm gonna be reading. I sort of lost where I was at, but I think I found it. President Young explains the significance of the name of Adam and how he obtained his role in the creation. Why was Adam called Adam? He was the first man on earth, and its framer and maker. He, with the help of his brethren, brought it into existence. Then he said, I want my children, who are in the spirit world, to come and live here. I once dwelt upon and enters something like this, in a mortal state. I was faithful, I received my crown and exaltation, I have the privilege, to ex- er, the privilege of extending my work, and to its increase there will be no end. Deseret News Weekly, uh, 22-308. I think it's page 22, uh, line through it or paragraph through it, one of those. No. Brigham Young even states that. Oh, it isn't? I'm at. I don't know. It's yeah, Desert hi. News, vol, volume 22. So each of the um, newspapers, because okay. uh, Desert News is a newspaper, and when they uh, compile them oh, into a book, they call it volume 22, page 308. Oh, okay. Go that ahead. makes sense. Okay. Uh, Desert News Weekly, Volume 22, page 308. Brigham Young even states that Adam was the chief manager in the creation of this earth. Though we have, though we have it in history that our father Adam was made of the dust of this earth, and that he knew nothing about his God previous to being made here, yet it is not so. And when we learn the truth, we shall see and understand that he helped to make this world and was the chief manager, chief manager in that operation. Journal of Discourses, uh, Volume 3, page 319. Apostle Franklin D. Richards, President of the European Mission, explained the following scripture. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Genesis uh, chapter 1, 28. Uh, verse 28, if the Lord God has ever withdrawn from Father Adam the authority here bestowed upon him, he has not seen fit to make it known to the world. Adam has continued to bear rule over the earth and control the desires or the destinies of his never-ending uh, posterity. Uh, that is page 70. Do you have anything to say? I'm going to take that as a no. From the time he received his commission in the Garden of Eden, he has been laboring diligently to fulfill the instructions there given him by the Lord God concerning his dominions, and to bring them under subjection to his will. This will be fully accomplished when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is the God of the whole earth. Then will the words of the prophet Brigham, when speaking of Adam, be fully realized. He is our Father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Millennial Star, uh, Volume 17, page 195. That's the end of that quote. <laughs> Brigham Young, in the following four references, declared that one of the first missions of the resurrected exalted beings is to begin the work of creating and peopling an earth and eventually acting as judge thereon. thereon. When they receive their crowns, their dominions, then they will be prepared to frame earth like unto ours and to people, to people them in the same manner as we have been brought forth by our parents, by our Father and our God. Journal of Discourses, Volume 18, page 259. Adam was an immortal being when he came to this earth. He had lived on an earth similar to ours. He had received the priesthood and the keys thereof and had been faithful in all things, and had gained resurrection and exaltation, and was crowned with glory, immortality, and eternal life, and was numbered with the gods, for such he was through his faithfulness. And he had begotten all of the spirits that were come to this earth. L. John Nettle Journal, uh, Volume 1, page 18, I think. If you look at things spiritually and then naturally and see how they appear together, you will understand that when you have the privilege of connecting the work that Adam commenced on this earth, you will have all your children come and report to you their sayings and acts. And you will hold every son and daughter of yours responsible when you get the privilege of being an Adam on earth. Journal of Discourses, uh, Volume 4, page 271. We are on page 71. Uh, Dad, do you have anything to say? No, I'm uh, I'm good right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they, the twelve tribes, will come up tribe by tribe. In the ancient of days, he who led Abraham and talked to Noah, Enoch, Isaac, and Jacob, that very being will come and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Journal of Discourses, Volume 11, page 326. Hence, all men who gain the crown of exaltation will bear spirit children and create an earth like this for them. They will become an atom upon their earthly creation and together with their ease produce mortal tabernacles so that those children may follow the laws of progression as their father has done before them. The glory of God is manifest in bringing to pass eternal life of his children so that his creations may continue to roll on through the eternities gaining an increase of dominions, power, and glory forever. The pain or the plan of salvation consists of a never ending creation of earth and an ever growing family of children. And that is the shortest chapter I have ever read. That is the end of chapter seven, beginning of chapter eight. And the next chapter is called Jesus, Son of Adam, and it is uh also not very long. Uh, you got anything to say? Uh, no, I'm actually at the mine, and uh, I am about ready to go up the hill. But yeah, pretty short chapter. Hold, hold on, real quick. Uh, there, I'm up there for two. Hello, Tucker. Have more coming up. Lucy, get away from the book. Go lay down.
All right. Uh, we don't have anybody called in yet. So um, did you have any questions or comments about any of the quotes that you read? I'm sorry. I was being attacked by Lucy. She tried to hang up on the radio show, and she tried to eat the book. Why are you like <laughs> this dog? What is your problem? <laughs> what is your malfunction? <laughs> Lucy was born on the same day as our daughter, uh, Emma, Lucy Bell, like Jim Walter, was born. And she would have been a year old that she passed away 13 hours after she was born. And uh, Kevin and Beverly Kraut had a dog that was born the same day that our daughter was born and Emma's sister. So that's Lucy Bell <laughs> for the people who, uh, yeah, you know, nobody know. We don't talk about Lucy Bell very much or Emma, but yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah. So did you have any questions or comments about anything that? Uh, Not really. Uh, I thought it was kind of quick. Don't have many thoughts on it. Yeah, um, right now it's pretty, pretty interesting, much though. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I don't really have anything to say about it either, uh, other than what I've already said in past radio programs. So, um, the uh, guest call in number is available for people who want to call in. Um, Do you want to, since we have time, do you have the studio open? Um, Yes. Uh, Yeah. Um, What other books are in the Enzyme to the Nations? What volume are you in? Uh, I am in, oh, this is volume three. And in the table of contents in the front, what books are included? So, Kevin Kraut, after his father passed away, compiled all of these books and put them onto a website, which is where we get the text to reading these things. But he also created seven volumes called The Enzyme to the Nations, which compile most of the things that Ogden completed. And Emmett, you are really loud in that. Just hurt my ears. So please don't do I'm that. sorry. I didn't know that. Really? I didn't well, think I was that loud. Okay. Well, the microphone picks things up that you well, might not stop. hear. But what was that that you just did? Uh, I was I like put the microphone away from my head, and I had like this little cough thing that I had to do. That's really weird. Okay, well, there is a mute button on the side of the my, uh, the headset that I gave you to do the program. So if you have to cough, please use the mic. But what other books are in that volume? volume there three? is Michael Adam, which is the one we're reading right now. Yeah, volume three. Uh, Model of okay. the Gold Plates, Mysteries of Creation, 95 Thesis, The One Mighty and Strong, The Only True God, Pamphlets, <laughs> Parallel Paths, Polygamy in the Bible, Preparation for the Kingdom, The Priesthood Garment, and Principles for Personality. Okay, all of those books are on the link in the description. When it when I when in the link in the description of the podcast or the radio show, um I I, I say, you know, read other great books on restoration theology. All of those books and probably about seventy something more or on that website, and they're free to read online for people who want to read that. But uh, can you go over, okay, so Michael Adam is the first book, which is talking about the Adam-God doctrine as taught by the early leaders of the LDS Church. It's not a theory. There's too much evidence to call it a theory, uh, but the LDS Church doesn't want to talk about it because they want to mainstream and smooth things out so that more people will accept Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. Um, it's like how flat but, earthers say the theory of gravity. <laughs> what about like, the theory of gravity? Oh, flat earthers. I I'm on a Reddit server. It's pretty funny. They talk about like dumb things that people say, 
and flat earthers say gravity is a theory, and it is technically a theory, even though it has been proven. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that <laughs> we can measure gra gravity? We can measure gravity from uh, other from what they think is uh, alternate universes. The uh, That's dark matter. Weird. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty awesome. So a lot of people do know if they listen to the program. I spend my time listening to things when I'm driving, and I get into quantum physics stuff, scientific stuff, um, theology stuff, history stuff. Magic. Thank you. But like science magic. I love it. I love learning. Um, God is a great scientist, and he understands all of these things at the greatest level. And uh, part of part of knowledge and, and part of your exaltation is actually learning all these type of things. So I love it. I love it. So, um, but, uh, okay, so what's the next book after Michael Adam? Uh my or model of the gold plate. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. These people. <laughs> and they're talking. Always talking. <laughs> okay. Sounds like it. What? Everybody's like, have a Sounds good new like year. Action. Oh, by the way. Yeah, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of talking, but oh, well. Anyway, so um, what's the next book after Michael Adam in that volume? Model of the Gold Plates. I have never read that book. That is one of the books I have never read. We should read that book. We should well, read the preview to that book. Um, but before you do that, okay. what's the next book after that? Because I want to talk about each one. Mysteries of, of Creation, the cool one. That is the most awesome book in the whole entire library. I love that book. <laughs> it's deep theology. If you are scared, do not swim. <laughs> <laughs> if you choke on the, uh, the milk of the gospel or cannot handle anything other than skim milk, do not read that book. But you're going to have your mind blown if you read that book because it is so awesome. But we're not covering that book right now. So what's the next book? Um, 95 Thesis. That's one of my favorite books as well. So 95 Thesis goes off of the 95 points of doctrine. Uh, and it, it's the, uh, the template of Martin Luther writing the 95 Thesis, which talks about 95 points of doctrine uh, that the Catholic Church had been turning away from. Emmett, please don't do that. I don't know what you're doing, but it hurts my ears. I have sensitive ears, people, and hopefully your ears are not being hurt by the uh, actions of my 16-year-old son. But anyway, um, okay, so... Um, and So Ogden basically took over 100 different points that the church has apostatized away from and made a book out of it talking about each one of those points of doctrine. And uh, that might be a book that we could read uh, right now since the radio show is so short. But uh, what's the next book in the list? The One Mighty and Strong, oh. I believe. And it's talking about, talking about myself. Not really. Uh, that book is talking about all of the theories and teachings of the church on the one mighty and strong, uh, going from the earliest leaders to the more modern leaders, and how they try to make excuses for it and all kinds of other stuff, and talking about how Joseph Smith is probably the one mighty and strong, but they're not sure, uh, which a vision I was shown in 2013 is that our um, – so the first – the the presidency of this earth under the direction of Yehovah our Elohim is Michael, our father, and uh, he's the first president. And then the, his two counselors or witnesses or apostles, so Jesus Christ was his first apostle. That's how he's an apostle, even though he had apostles under him. 
uh, because Jesus was the sent one. Um, and then God the Witness is the second count for our apostle. And then you have 12 under them who are mighty and strong. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are also called mighty and strong. So um, it, it's a pretty good book. I, I do enjoy reading that book. I do not come to the same conclusions as often in that book, just simply because I know by revelation who the mighty and strong ones are. So um, hold on. Two tube coming down. Uh, uh, sorry, the next one will be 197. All You're right. Breaking up a little bit. I know. I'm. I am coming down the hill. So um. So, a uh, pretty good book. What's the next one in that list in Volume 3? The Only True God, I believe is what it's called. Yes, and we have covered that one, but I probably need to go over it again because the audio wasn't the greatest back then. But, yeah, that's a pretty good book as well. Um, oh, okay, what's the next book in that list? Oh, you're sounding a little bit better now. Um, the next book is Pamphlets. <laughs> that was one of the first books that I read on Fundamentally Mormon, and it is also a very good book. It is a whole bunch of pamphlets that Ogden wrote over the years that he compiled into a book. And there is actually two volumes of pamphlets. So it's, uh, And all that stuff is... Uh, for free to read online at ogdencrowd.com. What's the next book? Uh, the next book after that is called Parallel Paths. That one is about the parallel paths of the inspired constitution of the United States and the restoration of the church and how they have both gone into apostasy. Good book. Uh, and I've read all these books on my old radio the program. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, B's closed. Anyway, so... Yeah. Anyway, so what's... What's the next book in that, uh... Among, among the... Polygamy books? in the Bible? That's a good book for all these people who want to reject polygamy and call it an abomination. So Joseph Smith said if they contradict... If any man comes to you and contradicts the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Doctrine and Covenants, you set them down as imposters. Which, if you take Jacob in the Book of Mormon and you have some of the uh, false interpretations that these uh, anti-polygamy people have, then that contradicts the Bible, which and the Book of Mormon, actually, and the Doctrine and Covenants. So you have to reject that. Um, also, Section 132 contradicts Jacob, uh, Jacob in the Book of Mormon, so you have to reject that as an overall revelation, although Brigham Young did uh, compile a bunch of stuff when he wrote that revelation, and there are many true things in it, but uh, there's landmines in there, there are things that are not true. So anyway, uh, mostly with David and Solomon multiplying wives, and then they uh, talk about you know, how that's not a big deal, but in Jacob chapter 2, I think, uh, Jacob receives a revelation from God in that chapter, and he is called out for, uh, David and Solomon are called out for the wickedness, which is multiplying wise, which is, anyway, uh, I'm a, Here's uh, golden place thing. I know, that's why I'm asking you, preview, Okay, let, let me get to it. It's page 1359. Okay. Um, set 63. This looks so weird. <laughs> okay, so this is a really interesting orientation if you're looking at it. Um, So instead of like all the other ones, right, like it's all formatted like a book, this one has... On every page, there are four squares that have a page number on them. Um, and there are, yeah, four on every page. And they're all, like, split up into sections. It's weird. Um, I'm just going to read the introduction, which is technically the first two pages. 
The Bible is a sacred history containing scripture from the prophets who lived in ancient times in the Eastern Hemisphere. The Book of Mormon is a sacred scripture containing a history of ancient prophets living in the Western Hemisphere, specifically on the American continents. continents. The Book of Mormon, unlike most of the Bible, w was translated from metal plates made of gold, which was not an unusual way to record history 2,000 years ago. How the modern-day discovery of this ancient and sacred record came about is a fascinating story. It began nearly 200 years ago in America. In the early 1820s, Joseph Smith, a young 15-year-old farm boy living in upstate New York, received an unusual manifestation that directed him to a certain hill in which the plates had been buried. Included in a large cement box plates was an, an instrument to be used in translating the engravings. When the, time, when the right time arrived, 1827, Joseph Smith was permitted to remove these plates from the hill Camorra and take them to his home. He discovered that they contained a history of an ancient civilization that existed on this, the American continent. It was a record of their prosperity and poverty, their wars and destruction. Also included were accounts of sacred experiences and religious beliefs. That is the end of the first page on that. Got something to say? I'm going to take that as a no um, and leave the second well, one. So the plates were actually an oh. alloy. Um, with, they were gold in appearance, but they were an alloy. So uh, 24 karat gold is pure gold, but if you get an 18 or 12 or 14% uh, or whatever, or 8%, um, it's, it's a mixture of gold and other things, which makes the gold har harder. But this specific alloy... Um, Joseph Smith did not understand these things, but scientists have found uh, this alloy in uh, the American continent in other records, and um, they, they're really light compared to gold. So they have the appearance of gold, but they weren't actually gold. So it's so, like how stainless um, steel looks silver, but it's actually not? <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah. Um, now, something interesting... Um, in New Mexico, there is Paleo-Hebrew engravings of the Ten Commandments that are in Las Lunas, New Mexico, which shows that there is actually evidence of, of um, Hebrew culture in the United States before Christopher Columbus. Now, something interesting about Paleo-Hebrew is a lot of people don't understand that that was the Hebrew that they used before the Babylonian captivity. So before Babylon, before they were taken off to Babylon, which was the time period when Lehi left Jerusalem, uh, they actually had a different letter uh, format for the Hebrew language, which we call Paleo-Hebrew. And then after the Babylonian captivity, they have the Babylonian Hebrew, which is a complete different uh, lettering system. It, it's just, it's not the same at all. Anyway, but something interesting about that is um, Lehi was commanded to leave uh, Jerusalem before Babylon came and took over. And that was the Hebrew that they used. And that would be the Hebrew, if there was any Hebrew, written by Lehi or Nephi or any of those guys, that's the Hebrew that they would have continued on with because they did not know the Babylonian Hebrew because that had not yet been invented and would not be invented until the Israelites, uh, specifically Judah and Benjamin and the Levites that were there, were taken off into Babylon. Now, uh, something also interesting is that in the Memphis, Tennessee area, and Cairo, or Cairo is how they pronounce it, Illinois. The reason that area is um, called after Egyptian names is because they found Egyptian artifacts in that area. Not, a, not a, just a couple, either. They found tombs, which shows that uh, there was travel between uh, Egyptian people who understood Egyptian culture which the Jews did because they came out of Mitzarim, which is the Hebrew word for Egypt. Um, you know, they came out of Egypt. So uh, they were familiar with Hebrew culture. But I believe that there were other people in the Americas 
besides the uh, besides the Egyptians or the Hebrews, we know that the Chinese came over to uh, to North America. There's artifacts that are from uh, the Chinese dynasty. Also, something else interesting, and I'm going to break up for a minute, but I'll try to say it. Hopefully, I don't break up. Um, so, something else interesting I found out the other day was that the uh, Jaredites. In the Book of Mormon, they were commanded to have these barges built. And the brother of Jared, uh, he understood that the Jews, or that Noah, was given uh, rocks that lit up the inside of the ark. And um, they understood that. And the Jews keep that to themselves pretty much, but they also understand that. And the brother of Jared living just shortly after the ark and all of that, they understood that's how Noah came. Uh, that's how they lit the inside of the ark. So when Jared produces these stones and asks God to touch them so that they will light up, it is because um, it's because he understood that God had already done that. Now, Joseph Smith, living in frontier uh, America in Palmyra, New York, would not have understood that. He did not have a Google, Rabbi Google, or Rabbi Firefox, or any uh, <laughs> YouTube videos to, um, to, you know, get these things to implement them into the Book of Mormon. He didn't understand that you know, that this was something that the Jews kept to themselves. But it's, it is uh, more evidence of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. And there's lots and lots of, of things that have been discovered. Now, there's things that have not yet been discovered. And the, skull, or the uh, skeptics like to take those things and, and they discount the things that have been shown, but then they also discount the things that have not yet been proven. For instance, barley. Uh, they had barley in the, in the Book of Mormon, and there is a form of barley that is found in the southwest uh, uh, United States of America uh, that was ancient from pottery that had grain in it that was sealed. You know? And uh, another thing, too, really interesting, to show that there was uh, travel back and forth before the uh, Columbus era, there are cathedrals over in Italy and other places in what is the old Roman Empire where they have lilies, or, yeah, lilies, this, uh, like carved into um, the, the, the cathedrals. And one that's really awesome, they had pineapples, which were only found in Hawaii, uh, carved into the cathedrals that were built before the coming of Christopher Columbus, which further shows uh, travel between the old world and the new world. So, um, you know, when people say, oh, there was no Jews here, there absolutely was Jews. And when these, uh, these skeptics pull these DNA tests out of context and say that there are no DNA from, from the Middle East, well, uh, haplogroup type X actually... Uh, shows that they uh, that there are certain tribes of Indians which have descendants DNA mitoc mitochondrial DNA from the Middle East. So you know, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that that the Book of Mormon isn't so preposterous. But the only reason I know that the Book of Mormon is true is because when I ask God to heal me and show me the truth. Um, he sent me two missionaries. And not long after uh, I finally listened to them, I asked God in the name of Jesus Christ if the Book of Mormon was true, and he healed me 100%. And the Holy Spirit came down on me with great fire and filled my whole soul as the, as the Spirit cleansed me of my drug addiction. And uh, that's why I know the Book of Mormon is true. And I assumed for a long time that because the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith is a true prophet, well, then the LDS Church must be true. But then in my studies, because I study like a madman, 
Um, I actually found out that the LDS Church has apostatized and that it was prophesied in the Book of Mormon and in Isaiah. So um, that's why God said, or Jesus said, he had had to send one mighty and strong to set the house of God in order. And all of these people that want to make all kinds of excuses, uh, they're actually, they think they're doing God a service. They're not. They're not doing God a service because with that, they are trying to discount the need for the uh, prophecy to be fulfilled of the one mighty and strong coming to set the house of God in order um, and continue on with making excuses as to why we don't have to do as God has instructed us. And uh, I heard President Nelson giving a talk, and he was like, the plan of soul or the restoration is all about helping you to progress, which I thought was interesting because the progression of the gods is a thing that used to be taught. And I wonder if he understands or even knows about the progression of the gods, which is, you know, a mystery that Joseph revealed, which the church has walked away from. But also, the Book of Mormon is an evidence that God lives. It's the second witness of Jesus Christ. And it is also a mark so that you would hear Joseph Smith and the prophecies and the instructions that he gave that were given to him by Jesus Christ for Zion's redemption. And in Genesis chapter 9 of the Inspired Translation, it says, When a people live all that God has commanded, then when they establish Zion below, they shall look up and Zion will come down out of heaven with the church of the firstborn, which is important for Adam and Andi Amon to happen, which has to happen. And that's talked about in Daniel chapter 7 as well, where the Ancient of Days, who is Michael, who was Adam, comes and all of the keys are given back to Father Adam because he is the first president of this earth. And then uh, he gives those keys to his son, Jesus, who has become a father through the law of adoption when he paid for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane, which these things are not fully understood by the church but they were taught by Joseph Smith. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm blabbing on, but go ahead with uh, the next page of the model. Okay. okay. The, this record is, a value, or is valuable to us because it contains an excellent account of righteous principles and laws, obedience or disobedience, to which can determine the rise and fall of all nations. It is especially pertinent to us because it contains prophecies about our time. Joseph Smith was instructed, instructed by an angel of God, Moroni, to translate this record written in Reformed Egyptian into the English language. Since two-thirds of the plates were sealed, the translation of the third portion became known as the Book of Mormon, after it was printed in 1830 in Palmyra, New York. Joseph Smith was immediately denounced and persecuted by those who didn't believe that such divine manifestations could occur at that time. While some considered him to be an inspired prophet, others labeled him a fraud and a gold digger. The controversy continues today, but it is suggested that some degree of knowledge about the prophet Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon be acquired before an honest decision is made. And that is the end of page two and the end of the introduction to this chapter. Okay, so a couple things. Um, so, yeah, two-thirds of the Book of Mormon were not given to us by the angel Moroni, which, by the way, uh, in Revelations, John sees an angel come from the throne of God in the midst of heaven in the last days, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, crying with a loud voice, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, the day of the Lord is at hand. This is something that is supposed to happen before the second coming of Jesus Christ, where the gospel is restored by an angel who has the everlasting gospel to give to men on the earth, and that man that that angel gave it to was Joseph Smith, and that angel, his name was Moroni, and he was a prophet of the tribe of the house of Joseph, uh, I'm not sure if he was from Manasseh or from, from uh, Ephraim, but th that prophecy uh, began to be fulfilled in the early part of, I think it was 18, 
1829 or no, maybe it was before that. I can't remember the exact dates, but yeah. So also, um, God is beginning to work among different prophets in the earth that are in the LDS church and are not in the LDS church. And they are people like Samuel the Lamanite. So Samuel the Lamanite was not the president of any church. He was an individual who nobody knows where he went to. Well, we do, but, well, maybe you don't. Anyway, but um, he climbed the walls, and he preached about, uh, you know, what God told him to say, and then he went and did, he did his thing. And there's, there are many prophets in the world today that are doing God's work. It's like a big old chessboard. We're the white pieces and Satan's the black pieces. <laughs> so, um, but there's a man down in Brazil named Marcuccio. Mer Mer um, Mar I can't remember his first name. His last name's Berger. But anyway, uh, he has also seen the angel Moroni, according to the account. And they're, uh, they have the gold plate. And um, there was a ring in the box with the, the, uh, the gold plates that Joseph Smith was given, uh, as well as the sword of Laban and uh, a harness to keep the Urim and Thummim in that the brother of Jared had, and the Urim and Thummim, and a bunch of other things. Well, that ring has a seal on it, and when Moroni was creating the gold plates out of all of the other records that he took. So the Book of Mormon is an abridgment of, of many records. Uh, he actually pressed that ring, uh, in uh, that, that piece of metal, into the, the soft plate of the uh, what we have, the gold plates. And what's really cool is that it was not taken by God, and it was uh, passed down to uh, the presidents of the LDS Church, Brigham Young, John Taylor, all the way to Joseph F. Smith, I think it was. And then Joseph Smith gave it to uh, Joseph F. Smith gave it to one of his kids. And um, when Mercutio, um, you know, he's got the gold plates, the the ring that comes from that family that has passed it down to that to that family. It actually matches the gold plates. So that's kind of cool. I just learned that the other uh, last week, I think it was. Anyway, go ahead with the reading of that. Emma. How many pages are there in that uh, particular uh, book? Um, it's kind of confusing. Um, so, so go to the end of the total... book, and then the last bracket that you see will have a number in it, and that is the page number for the last page. So there's 46 pages. But there's a bunch of ones that have pictures on them that are just pictures on part of the page. And also, also, this has got to be the weirdest part. So did I tell you how it was organized? Go ahead. So on every page, there's four pages. They're all separated. Um, there's one top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, just in four rectangles. Yeah, and because and they had it, pictures... Yeah, it's really confusing to look at, but it's also pretty cool. Okay. So go ahead yeah. with page uh, three, because I'm interested. I've never okay. read this before. It's one of the few books that I have not read from Ogden Kraut. Okay. Um, anyways. <clears throat> Purpose of the Book of Mormon. On the title page of the Book of Mormon, it explains that this is an abridgment from many records kept by these ancient people. The intent of this other Bible is to convince both Jews and Gentiles that Jesus is the Christ who has manifested himself unto all nations and people. Joseph Smith gave the following reasons why the book was written. Oh. One. Or first, that a knowledge of the Savior might come to the remnants of the house of Israel in the Western Hemisphere. Two, that the Indians, Lamanites, might come to a knowledge of their origin. Three, that the Lamanites might know the promises of the Lord regarding their fathers and themselves. And that is the end of page three. Okay, continue on with page four. Okay. Witnesses. 
the first witness to the Book of Mormon as uh, as a being sacred book was Joseph Smith himself. From the time that he first told the story as a 15-year-old boy, he never changed or denied his testimony, even under the worst forms of mockery, ridicule, and persecution. He never retracted his story. If he would have just denied the spiritual and divine guidance in his story, he could have avoided all the troubles and opposition. Three witnesses. To support the divine origin of the account, or of this account, there would need to be additional witnesses. Three other men were permitted to fill this role, and they gave the following testimony. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that we, through the grace of the God Father, or of God the Father, <laughs> and our Lord Jesus Christ, have seen the plates which contain this record, which is a record of the people of Nephi, and also the Lamanites, their brethren, and also the people of Jared, who came from the tower of which hath been spoken. And we also know that they have been translated by the gift and power of God, for his voice hath declared un or hath declared it unto us. Wherefore we know of a surety that or of a surety that the work is true. And we also testify that we have seen the engravings which are upon the plates, and they have been shown unto us by the power of God and not of man. And we declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven and he brought and laid up before our eyes oh, he brought and laid before our eyes that we beheld and saw the plates and the engravings thereon. And we know that it is by the grace of God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, that we beheld and bear record that these things are true, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Nevertheless, the voice of the Lord commanded us that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, to be obedient unto the commandments of God, we bear testimony of these things, and we know that if we are faithful in Christ, we shall rid our garments of the blood of all men, and be found spotless before the judgment seat of Christ, and shall dwell with him eternally in the heavens, and honor to be the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. Oliver Calvary, David Whitmer, Martin Harris. And that is the end of page five, and four, because it was like a really long connected page. Okay, cool. Um, so the guest call-in number for anyone listening with any questions or comments about uh, theology in general uh, can call in. The guest call-in number is 917-889-8827. If you do call in, I will bring you into a private screening room and ask you if you want to come on the air and ask you what your questions or comments are. And then if you want, you can come on live. And if not, then I'll address the question live on the air, and you can listen. So anyway, uh, 917-889-8827, which is a Manhattan, New York number. I don't know why. They send me that number, and the majority of the people that I want to talk to are Mormons. <laughs> but, uh, but it is what it is. So anyway, <laughs> um, go ahead with page 6, MS. Okay. Eight witnesses. Eight additional men also witnessed to the world what they had seen, these plates that had the appearance of gold, or that they had seen, these plates that had the appearance of gold. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, and tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the translator of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which hath the appearance of gold, and as many of the leaves as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and of curious worksmanship. Or workmanship. And this we bear record with words of soberness, and that the said Smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and hefted and known of a surety. That is such a weird word. That the said Smith has gotten the plates of which we have spoken. And we give our names unto the world to witness unto the world what we have seen, or that which we have seen. And we lie not, God bearing witness to it. 
uh, Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Jr., John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith Sr., Hiram Smith, and Samuel H. Smith. It is remarkable that these 11 witnesses never denied their testimony regarding the gold plates, even though many personal trials and persecutions, or even through many personal trials and persecutions. And that is the end of page six. Yeah, and a lot of people actually, uh, a lot of these guys actually apostatized, but some of them did come back. Okay, so go ahead with the next one, Emmett. I'm going to bring the caller into the screening room and just ask them if they have anything to say or, uh, and all that stuff. So I will be in the screening room with the person who has called. Like I said, anybody else can call in with questions or comments. The guest call in number is 917-889-8827. Why are you bringing mom into the screening room? <laughs> Uh, it's mom's number. Oh, it's mom. Okay, hold on. I am near. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hello. Hi, Hi mom. Buddy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to bring you in the screening well, room. Okay, like, so why is so the deal. The room? <laughs> I can see that somebody calls in, but I'm not like I've got a tablet, and I'm using the stu- uh, you know, for the studio. But I I can't see because it's too far away from me. Uh, there's lots of noise, lots of people oh, screaming. Yes. Yeah. Hey, little girls. <laughs> yeah, shush, shush, girl. Uh, Neil Neil is trying to attack Eliza, the blob under the blanket. <laughs> oh. So Cam uh, went to our friend's house. So when I worked in the oil fields, I became good friends with. Uh, a man by the name of Neil, and I will not share his last name. And uh, we like to go to his house sometimes and just say hi and visit. And I am working, so I'm not, I can't go there. And it's snowing here, by the way, Kim, so that's all fine. Oh, it's fun. snowing over there. So there, he's driving in the snow right now. Neil was wondering, and just wondering, and Danielle was wondering, what I was doing and how come you haven't called me a million times. So <laughs> I was like, well, I think they're doing a radio show. So then I was calling in to see what was going on over oh. there. Yeah, so the chapter that we read was really short. I told you that was ridiculous yesterday. I was like, uh, that's not going to be very much conversation piece. <laughs> so we were kind of previewing different books, and I was talking and giving a little synopsis about that, and I can hear myself talking in your phone. Oh, hold Do on you have your headset Marie. with you? Oh, she muted herself. Anyway, if she can still hear me, we're actually reading a book, and we're not going to read it all tonight because we just don't have time, but the book is about the uh, the gold plates. So pretty interesting stuff. Glad that Ogden compiled well, this stuff. That does sound interesting. It's uh, called the model of the gold plates. I think I'm at. What is it called again? Yeah, it's called the model. The model of the gold plates. You broke up. Yeah, that's what. It's or called. I broke up. I broke up, or you broke up. But anyway, yeah. Okay, so. And uh, so, yes, we have a guest, and her name is Kimberly, and she is my wife. <laughs> She's usually the co-host, along with Emmett. Anyway, go ahead, Emmett. What's the next uh, next page? Uh, the next page is page seven. Go and ahead and read that. almost done with, I think, the first part of this, or first chapter, or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> The size and capacity of the plates. Some people might ask how the 522 pages of the translated Book of Mormon could possibly have been written on a portable set of gold plates. The question before us is, could one-third, two-thirds being sealed, of a volume of metal leaves 6 by 8, or 8 by 7 by 4 inches, or 8 by 7 by 6 inches, contain a sufficient number of plates, each as thick as parchment or tin, to yield the necessary space for the entire text of the Book of Mormon. Um, talking from personal knowledge, yeah, definitely. Gold is, like, ridiculously malleable. 
And if you like mix it with almost anything, that stuff retains most of the malleability. And I think an ounce of gold can stretch over a space that's a mile wide uh, without tearing. <laughs> um, upon a sheet of paper by seven inches, a Hebrew translation of 14 pages of the American text of the Book of Mormon has been written in the modern square of Hebrew letters in common use. It was is demonstrated in this sheet that the entire text of the Book of Mormon, as the American readers have it, could have been written in Hebrew on 43 or no 40 and 3 7 pages, 21 plates and all. Commentary on the Book of Mormon, Reynolds and so Sojdal, Volume One, page 39. I can't pronounce that name. It's S J O D A H L. Um, the plates were originally written in a reformed type of Hebrew and Egyptian, which means they were inscribed with a type of shorthand making it even more condensed. Gold is a pliable metal and can be made in the sheets the thickness of paper, as I was saying. It is very enduring and unaffected by time and elements. Uh, yeah, that's the end of page seven, give or so. Give or okay, so Joseph Smith had the plate but he did not translate from the plates. Like I said, in the box that the plates were contained in, which the angel Moroni uh, led him to, actually had something called a Urim and Thummim. Also, Joseph was gifted in the gift of seer, seership with a seer stone, which a seer, uh, if they do not, are they develop, they, if you have the gift of seership, um, you can develop that more, um, purely, I guess, um, with a seer stone. I've never needed a seer stone to be a seer, um, but Joseph Smith did need a seer stone, and he he used the seer stone even before, um, you know, even before he got the plate, uh, he had a seer stone. And, and there's a book about seer stones in the website, ogdencrowd.com, talks about a whole bunch of uh, different stuff with seer stones. And you can actually buy, uh, well, you, sometimes you can buy on Amazon. People do sell seer stones and shamans use them. But uh, Joseph Smith also has the Urim and Thummim, which are also seer stones. And uh, I think that in Hebrew, Urim and Thummim means light and knowledge, if I'm, if I'm correct in that. Anyway, but... Um, so, like, when I give a talk at church, wherever I'm giving a talk, um, I will write down a bunch of thoughts, and I will um, make a bunch of, like, um, earmarks, or not earmarks, but, like, bulletin points, and then I will uh, look at those, and if the Spirit leads me to, sometimes I just go off and I just talk, and all this stuff comes into my head, uh, but um, the gold plates could have been kind of like a bulletin point. And then uh, as Joseph Smith went through, um, God gave him the text using the Urim and Thummim. So um, it's interesting. All of this stuff's interesting. Um, and I would have thought it was all ridiculous, uh, especially when I was an anti-Mormon Baptist. And I used to, like, study all the anti-Mormon crap. Um, but I know that Joseph Smith's a prophet because of Revelation, not because of any of this stuff. But uh, this was a this was a, a catalyst to uh, Joseph Smith receiving the information for the Book of Mormon. Anyway, go ahead, Emma. What's the next page? Oh, Ken, did you have anything to say about any of this? And I can see that she's still on. Mother. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to continue reading because she's not saying anything. Okay, sounds good. Oh, and by the way, just keep on reading because uh, I am at the spur and I'm going to dump this coal into a grizzly so it can go into a pile so that it can go into a train. So I will be listening, but I will be muted because it gets kind of loud. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to finish probably this part of the chapter or whatever it's called. Because it's not exactly split up into chapters, but it sort of is. Like, there's different...
sections or whatever. Okay. Like well, a, go ahead and read okay. until um, I'm able to come back on. Also, if you would like to read the different topics in the 95 thesis, those are good things to go over on a program like this that's short. Cool. And your headset is all over the place. Okay. <laughs> so better. please well, try okay. to be professional about the audio quality of the podcast radio show. Man, that's a good one, being professional. <laughs> yeah, you better professional up, boy. Uh, by the way, everybody, Emmett is 16 years old. And, yes, go ahead, Emmett. <laughs> uh, yeah. After Joseph Smith had completed the translation, the plates of the Book of Mormon and the other two-thirds were once again hidden in the earth. The rest of the record to come forth and be translated at some future time. In 1830, when the first edition of the Book of Mormon was published, it was not thought possible that anyone among the American Aborigines had any knowledge of writing on gold tablets. However, gold was abundant in the Americas, and it was later discovered that the writings on the plates of gold was abundant as well. When the Spanish conqueror, Pizarro, held the Inca ruler, uh, I can't pronounce any of these, he held some guy whose name is like Asalupa. He held him for ransom. The latter offered enough gold to fill a room 17 by 22 feet, halfway up the wall, for his freedom. That's a lot of gold. Exhibited today in and some they, of the museums of South the, America. Uh, they used that gold to write on, too. Like, uh, when Cortez came in, he actually took a lot of that gold and melted it down and destroyed ancient records that they had kept on gold plates. Anyway, go ahead, Emma. Yo, what a waste of gold. (laughs) Melting down writing. Anyways. Which is why... Some of the museums... (laughs) Which is why the angel Moroni took the plates away from Joseph, because people were trying to steal them from him. Anyway, go ahead. Exhibited today in some of the museums of South America are plates of tin gold, some already engraved with hieroglyphs, while the others are blank and ready for engraving. Elder Melvin J. Ballard gave an account of seeing some of these gold plates in a museum in Lima, Peru. He stated that they were about 7 by 8 inches in size, which is approximately the same size as those from which Joseph Smith translated. The loose leaf ring binding that is now used in some trade magazines, catalogs, notebooks, etc., was described by over 180 years ago by Joseph Smith, who said that the golden plates were held together at the outer edge by rings, which permitted the plates to open as the pages of a book. Calm down, Lucy. Ugh. The Old Testament also records the engraving of the words on a gold plate. For God told Moses, and thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signal. Uh, holiness to the Lord, Exodus twenty-eight thirty-six. Okay, this page here has like a serious printing issue or something. It's about halfway down the page that quote ends, and I think the rest of it's supposed to be partially blank. But like the last couple sentences of the quote are all broken up. Anyways, that is the end of that chapter. And my voice is hurting. Oh, are you there, Mom? I'm going to continue reading, like, the next page or so. The Identity of Book of Mormon People (laughs) From within the pages of the Book of Mormon comes the story of at least three migrations of people to the Americas. One group, the Jaredites, came at the time of the destruction of the Tower of Babel. Another people, later identified as the Nephites and Lamanites, were led by Lehi out of Jerusalem around 600 B.C. in order to escape the the impending destruction of that city. The American Indians are believed to be descendants of those people. Biblical prophecy refers to a people coming to the Americas. When the old patriarch Jacob called his sons in to give him a patri- or them a patriarchal blessing, Joseph received the most favorable and interesting blessing of all. Jacob told him 
Joseph is a fruitful bow. Even a fruitful uh, bow by a well, bow maybe, whose branches run over the wall. Genesis uh, chapter 49, verse 22. It has been interpreted to mean that the well was the great ocean and the branches that run over the wall, or the wall, I can't tell if it's trying to say wall or well. The branches that run over the wall referred to some of his posterity. Joseph had been educated in the language of the Egyptians while he was in Egypt and handled the affairs of Pharaoh. He became familiar with their written languages, arts, and science. Thus, his children would have received much of the same learning. A history of the escape of these two families from Jerusalem around 800 BC is contained within the Lord or within the Book of Mormon itself. They were instructed by the Lord how to build a ship and guided across the Indian and Pacific Oceans to this hemisphere. The third group was called the Mulekites, who also left Jerusalem about the time King Zedekiah, or Zedekiah <laughs> was taken captive. They crossed the Great Waters and probably settled in the area of Central America. And that is the end of another chapter, uh, the identity of the Book of Mormon people. Uh, are you guys there? Yeah, um, I just got back into the truck. Cool. Okay, well, that is the end of... I believe we are actually one, two... At the end of the third chapter, maybe fourth. That might be a different chapter. Okay. It's confusing because, like, some of the chapters are labeled as some things, but some aren't. Okay. 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 Well, uh, your bit. voice is starting to hurt, so that's a good preview for people if they're interested in going ahead and taking a look at the text of that book, uh, which you can find at OddsandCrowd.com, I believe. It's there. And uh, you can also go to OddsandCrowd.com and contact Kevin Crowd to see if you can buy some of these books. Because he does print them. He owns a printing press and a printing shop. And, yeah, it's in Santa Quinn, Utah. It's called Pioneer Press. And the information for contacting him is at ogdencrowd.com. That's O-G-D-E-N-K-R-A-U-T.com. So, all right. Well, uh, we don't have any callers. And uh, I advertise the program pretty well. So if people wanted to call in, they could call in. But if they don't, that's fine. Luckily, we do have people who listen to this program in the podcast format. Also, I do upload these video, uh, these um, podcasts in a video format on my YouTube channel, Fundamentally Mormon, which you can find by going to youtube.com forward slash user forward slash God is my compass, all one word. So uh, if people are interested in this or uh, many of the thousands of other videos or podcasts that I have done, they can go find a lot of them there. Not all of them, because for some reason, uh, my first podcast that I did from 2014 to 2007, 16 or 17, well, they for the most part, have been erased by Blog Talk Radio. I don't know why. And uh, they're still, you can still find them, but when you try to uh, upload them to listen to them on Blog Talk Radio or on iTunes, they just stay unavailable. So, unfortunately, Satan is at work in trying to destroy truth, and this is, one of the things he's tried to destroy. So it is what it is. Anyway, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we end the program for today? Either Kim or Emma, I can't hear you. Okay. I don't know why Kim calls in and then she doesn't try to say anything. Like, I can see, I can see her on the studio still, but... Whatever. Anyway, um, Emmett, do you have the studio open? Yep. Would you please cue the end music? And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. God bless. And uh, 
have a good day. Bye. Thanks so much. Welcome. School of the Prophets, the first oath and covenant of the priesthood. All those who enter into the School of the Prophets or the Relief Society shall have taken the oath and covenant of the priesthood upon them, which oath is done by raising both hands to the square and saying, O Father, unto thee I pledge my oath. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. I will do all in my power to bring thy kingdom upon the earth. I covenant with thee that I will take thee as my law, and I will obey thy revelations unto me, whether they be revelations given to me or to another, but which are confirmed to me. It is the same. I know that ye cannot fail, and that I must obey the law upon which any blessing is predicated to get the good of that blessing. Even so, amen. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the school of the sons and daughters of the gods, even the school of, of magi and of prophets and of seers and of of priests and priestesses, kings and queens. I am the teacher that hath been appointed for this school, and I am standing in my place at the head of the circle, for there shall be established a circle with a triangle in the middle. The teacher and priest at the head of the circle is Elijah. The king upon the right side is called Messiah, and the magi upon the left is called Elias. You have come unto the house of the Lord to receive your second endowment, in the school of the prophets and in the Relief Society, the mysteries of God shall be revealed unto you in the bonds of brotherhood, sisterhood, charity, and love. 
all the rooms which ye shall meet in for the school of the prophets from this day forth shall be dedicated as a temple unto the living God, which is his house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. Wherefore, if ye will obey the order of this house, ye will speak in turn, walk in turn, and let the love and charity that ye have one for another grow as ye perform these binding ordinances. For the order of the ordinances in this house alone will expand the love ye have for one another. Dedicatory Prayer The dedicatory prayer is a prayer of dedication by the inspiration of the Spirit, dedicating it as a school and temple of God. Inviting God into the house or dedicated room. All shall take a white handkerchief and waving them say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Amen, Amen, and Amen. Now all those who wish to accept the obligations and blessings of the endowment, please raise your hands. Very well. Washing of feet. The holy priest of the holder washing the feet shall invite the patron to sit down and place a basin of water in front of him to put his feet in. The holy priest of the holder will then take off his garments and set them nearby and gird himself with a long towel like a temple robe over one shoulder. He will then kneel down and begin the washing of the feet, saying, Brother, by the authority of the priesthood, after the order of the Son of God, I wash your feet, preparatory to receiving your second anointing in the house of the Lord, that you may rule and reign in the house of Israel, or Adam, forever. And at this time wash you clean, every whit, that you are now clean from the blood and sins of this generation. I wash you clean of the blood and sins of this generation, and again I wash you clean of the blood and sins of this generation, that you may be called up and come forth in the morning of the first resurrection, and be clean without spot at the judgment bar of God, for you have done your part to warn the people of this generation, ridding your garments of their blood. Wherefore I declare by the authority of the holy priesthood that you are clean, and that your sins are forgiven if ye have repented. And I do this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This does not need to be the exact wording, but it, this is an example of the washing of feet. Salute. Now behold, mine son, after this has been done, he shall be accepted into the school by raising both hands high in the salute, and the priest, uh, and the priest shall also raise his hands high in the salute, and the priest shall say, Art thou a brother of brethren? I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in token or remembrance of the everlasting covenant, in which covenant I receive you to fellowship in a, in a determination that is fixed, immovable, and unchangeable, to be your friend and brother, through the grace of God and the bonds of love, to walk in all the commandments of God, blameless, in thanksgiving, forever and ever. And he that is found unworthy of this salutation shall not have place among you, for ye shall not suffer that mine house shall be polluted by him. And he that cometh in and is faithful before me, and is a brother, or if they be brethren, they shall salute the president or teacher with uplifted hands to heaven with this same prayer and covenant, or by saying, Amen, in token of the same. For behold, these words I give, gave to Joseph Smith, and they have not been abrogated. This shall be done in every session of the School of the Prophets and the Relief Society. Healing and Blessing Sisters are to give each other blessings of healing and comfort by the laying on of hands in the Relief Society. Brethren are to do the same when they are moved upon to do so. Brethren and sisters may also bless and dedicate handkerchiefs to assist in the healing of the sick, as well as blessing and dedicating other objects for purposes of power in the priesthood. Objects which are for protection and not for healing should be blessed with a rod or wand. Being Married to Christ do you have faith that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Then confess his name and covenant to never deny him as a testimony to the world. The initiate's own words. Then, thus saith the Lord to my messenger, Verily, verily, I say unto you, my son, I give unto you a commandment, declaring unto you that they who receive you receive me, and if they receive me, they receive him that sent you to salute them with my salutation in remembrance of my everlasting covenant, which I have received you to fellowship, 
may they receive you also as you receive them, that they may be clean from the blood of this generation, and be received by the washing of the feet. For unto this end was the ordinance of washing of feet instituted, being bound together in the bonds of brotherly love, and sealed together by the covenant of life and peace, which covenant abideth forever with the celestial saints, or in other words, the married uh, to Christ. And he that continueth not in this covenant shall not have place among you, for ye shall not suffer my house to be polluted by them, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. All those in the school shall then either wash one another's feet, or give the holy kiss in token of the same. And they shall say to one another, Do you receive me to be your friend and brother? Are you willing to salute me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in token and or remembrance of the everlasting covenant in which you receive me to fellowship in a determination that is fixed, immutable, and unchangeable to be your friend and brother through the grace of God in the bonds of love to walk in their commandments of God blameless and thanksgiving forever and ever? Amen. Amen. Are you willing to show to the world that you are clean from the blood of this generation? Do you covenant with me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? and in the presence of these witnesses, that you will love your companions in life as Christ loved the church, that you will cherish each other, comfort each other, forsaking all others who are not in the holy order, so long as you live? Yes. Having authority, I seal thee, brother, unto the anointed gods, even Christ, both male and female, and seal thee unto myself as mine own son in the first household of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Now men may be sealed to their wives in the second sealing, by taking them by the hand and saying, Art thou my sister? I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in token or remembrance of the everlasting covenant, in which I covenant to receive you to fellowship, and in a determination which is fixed, and immovable, and unchangeable, to be your friend and brother, through the grace of God, in the bonds of love, to walk in all the commandments of God, blameless and thanksgiving, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold, sisters may also make the covenant and say, Amen, in token of the same. Also to the unmarried, I the Lord willeth that you should, be, you should marry in, in the order, that I may have a pure people, saith the Lord. All who have covenanted to only marry within the holy order say, Amen. This order shall not be broken by any until they themselves stand in the garden of paradise, ready to fall lest they be destroyed. Amen. Amen. Covenant to enter into a united order. The patron receiving it will put his arm to the square and repeat after he who is administering the covenant, saying, I, brother, so-and-so, do covenant and promise before God, angels, and these brethren in the united order, that I will consecrate all my mind, strength, and wealth unto this united order, and that I will hold all things in common with my brethren according to my stewardship, and I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Baptism into the United Order After dedicating the water and going into the water as described above, you hold on to the one being baptized and raising your right arm to the square, you say, Brother, by the authority of the Melchizedek Priesthood, which I hold, I baptize you into the Order of Enoch, which is the United Order before God, and I say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You then immerse them in the water and then undedicate the water. The Meal of the Prophets The members of the school and or relief society shall sit at a table. A glass of wine and a small stack of flatbread shall be provided for each member. A blessing shall be given. O Father, which art in heaven, by the authority of the priesthood, after the order of the Son, we bless this bread to all the souls which shall partake of it, that they may do it in fellowship and brotherhood being knit in one through the love of Christ, which is charity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. O Father, which art in heaven, by the authority of the priesthood, after the order of the Son, we bless this wine to the souls which shall partake, drink of it, that they may do it in the Spirit, worshiping thee and their mother in spirit and in truth, being knit in one through charity, the greatest of all. For we know that if we are not one, then we are not yours. Even so, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The washing of with alcohol. When only men are present, then there can be a washing with a cloth and alcohol. Brother, having authority, I wash your body clean, that it may be healthy, strong, and full of virtue and power. I wash your sins away with charity, making your garments white, even making thee clean every whit of the blood and sins of this generation. 
I do this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Provisional Anointing By the authority of the priesthood, after the order of the Son, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I pour this holy consecrated oil upon thy head, and give unto thee, unto you a holy anointing. I anoint and ordain thee a king and a priest of the Most High God, to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever, predicated upon this anointing being sealed. I give thee power to bind on earth, and have it bound in heaven. And whomsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whomsoever thou shalt curse shall be cursed, and whomsoever thou shalt bless shall be blessed. But remember that these things must be done in accordance with those things which have been done before the foundations of the world. I bless thee that ye shall come forth in the first and holy resurrection, and I even ordain you to be one of the sons Amen. I bless thy head and mind that you may receive revelations in carrying on the work. I bless thy eyes that ye may see visions and the eternal worlds. I bless thy nose that ye may smell the sweet smells of the eternal worlds. I bless thy mouth that ye may speak truth. I give thee this holy anointing in the name of Elohim, and in the name of Jehovah, and in the name of the Godhead of this earth, even Michael, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, who presides over the spirits of just men and women made perfect. Amen. Patriarchal Blessing Brother, by the authority of the patriarchal priesthood and in the and the priesthood after the order of the Son, I lay my hands upon your head and give you a patriarchal blessing in the school of the prophets. Then you shall give the blessing by the Spirit, and do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Council of the Prophets The keys of the Holy Kiss shall be given. The first or ironic sign of the Holy Kiss is made by embracing and kissing the right cheek, and then the left, and then the right again, and saying, Peace be upon you. The second or Melchizedek sign of the Holy Kiss is made by embracing and kissing the right cheek, and then the left cheek, and then the forehead, and saying, Peace be upon you. The third or patriarchal sign of the Holy Kiss is to kiss upon the lips, and saying, God be with you. The first Holy Kiss is for brethren and sisters in the priesthood and siblings. The second Holy Kiss is for parent and child in the priesthood or familial bonds. The third Holy Kiss is for eternal mates or fellow eternal members of the Holy Order of the opposite gender that you love or are attracted to and feel close enough to, sufficient to merit this kiss. If the motion of this kiss, holy kiss is not reciprocated, then continue with the first in all charity and love. Let all receive it. Let all who are present give the appropriate holy kiss to those sitting upon their right hand and upon their left, and saying unto them, Peace be upon you, or God be with you, or Shalom in token of the same. That will do. Now the members of the holy the school of or the Relief Society shall return to the circle and a rod presented. Brethren and sisters, this rod is the rod of the word of God, and whoever shall hold the rod hath the right to speak, and all others must be silent until the possessor of the rod hath finished speaking. If you desire to speak, you should put your right foot forward until he who possesses the rod shall give thee the rod. Now if he shall continue to speak long enough after that, that it seemeth he is ignoring a brother or a sister, or a mother, or a father, or a son, or a daughter, in the Lord, then all shall put their feet out also. He shall then repent himself of speaking, and give the rod away. The rod is the word of and law of God, and that which is confirmed by the members. Having felt the Spirit shall be considered scripture. Members shall confirm a saying, by raising both hands above their head, and repeating it, and then saying, Amen, after it hath been proposed for a vote. Behold, brethren, now that we are one, let the mysteries be opened up unto us.